Not all expensive algorithm operations are as bad as they look. Have you ever wondered how dynamic arrays can still claim constant time inserts, even when they occasionally copy everything just to resize? If you are just joining, this is a part of our deep dive into the amortized analysis, but don't worry, we will start from fresh. In this video, we will walk through how to use the potential method to estimate the average cost of a sequence of algorithm operations. So what does a potential method do, and how does that work? This method defines a potential function. You can think of it as a way to measure the stored energy inside the data structure. The key idea is that when we perform expensive operations, they are not always costly on their own. Instead, they are releasing the potential that was built up by earlier and cheaper operations. Using the potential method to estimate the amortized cost involves four steps, as you see here on the screen. The first step is to define a potential function. The second step is to compute the amortized cost per operation. The third step is to perform the validity check over n operations. And the last step is to calculate the average cost per operation. Let's go over the details of each of these steps first. The first step is to define a potential function. What exactly is a potential function? Think of it like a way to store energy in a spring. Each time when we do a simple operation, it's like compressing the spring a little bit, storing energy. Later, when we need to do a more expensive operation, we can release that stored energy to help pay for it. In more formal terms, the potential function phi assigns a value, or say a number, to the current state of a data structure. The number represents the potential, or say how much work has been stored up so that we can use it later. The value is zero at the very start, I mean the initial state and it will always be bigger than or equal to zero as the state evolves, because it represents a potential. In physics, if you think about the kinetic energy, there is no such a thing as a negative potential. That said, if you come up with a potential function that sometimes generates a negative value, you will know that it needs to be updated. The second step is to compute the amortized cost per operation. If you know other amortized analysis methods, this may sound very strange, because it may not be possible. However, using the potential method, this is something that you can do. How do you do that exactly? Think about you have a number of operations. The number is i. After operation i, we are looking at two things. The actual cost of that operation, or say how much work it really did, and the change in potential or say how much the stored energy increased or decreased between the last and the current operations. To get the amortized cost, we simply add these two things together. The amortized cost after i number of operations is simply the sum of the actual cost of i's operation and the change in potential from the i minus 1's operation to this i's operation. The third step is to perform the validity check over n operations. The goal of this step is to verify that the total amortized cost can serve as an upper bound of the total actual cost. To achieve this, you will use the help from the relationship between the amortized cost and the actual cost per operation by summing up over n operations on both sides of this equation. After that, you can further simplify the computation of the total amortized cost based on the recursive nature of this relationship. The last step is to calculate the average cost per operation based on step 3 by dividing the total amortized cost by n. In case if you wonder what the difference between step 2 and 4 is, they are about the same. Or say, they are the same for nearly all the cases, and the difference is trivial and it doesn't affect the final result. An advantage of the potential method is that if you have a valid and working potential function, 
you can immediately deduce the amortized cost per operation. Going through steps 3 and 4 will make the process more robust and free of mistakes. Let's apply the four steps to an example to get a better understanding of how things work. We will go through an example focusing on the insertion operation of dynamic arrays. The array size starts as 1, and we will keep executing the insertion operation, which has one element to the array at a time. When the array is full, the insertion operation needs to do some extra work before adding a new element, which includes creating a new array that doubles the size of the original array, copying and pasting all the existing elements into this new array. And the new array will replace the old one as the new data storage. As you can see, the worst case scenario of the insertion operation may not be representative of a sequence of them. So amortized analysis is needed. To apply the potential method to analyze the insertion operation, we will follow the four steps. We will start with a potential function. For example, we can use a simple linear function to compute the potential like this one, where n represents the number of elements in an array, and c represents the capacity of the array. The potential at the current state can be computed as 2 multiplied by n minus c. The initial potential when the array is empty is 0, of course. After the first insertion operation, n, the number of elements, becomes 1, while c, the capacity of the array, stays as 1. So it computes as 2 multiplied by 1 minus 1, that will give you 1. Resizing happens when you go from row 2 to 3, and from row 4 to row 5. In both cases, the potential computation doesn't go negative. The same can be said for all other rows. As you see from this example, the potential function always computes to a non-negative number. As the state evolves, the number of elements n can only be as big as the array capacity c. And that's when the difference between n and c is the smallest. After each resizing, n is one number bigger than c divided by 2. And that's when the difference between n and c is the biggest. As such, the potential function always leads to non-negative numbers, which means that the function is usable. Which also means that we can move to step 2 to compute the amortized cost per operation. In case you forget, we followed this formula to calculate the amortized cost per operation. We need to know two things, the actual cost and the change in potential. However, depending on the actual case, the actual cost of the insertion operation is different. Let's look at a case where there's plenty of spaces in the array, or say when no resizing is needed. In this case, the actual cost of inserting a new element into the array is simply 1. The capacity of the array, represented by c in the potential function, will stay the same, as no resizing happens. As such, we can compute the potential of the two neighboring states, like between n and n plus 1 operations. The potential after n plus 1 operations will simply be 2 multiplied by n plus 1, and then minus c. The n plus 1 here represents the number of elements after n plus 1 operations. Similarly, the potential after n operations will be 2 multiplied by n minus c, where n represents the number of elements after n insertion operations. So the change of potential between the two states is simply 2, a constant number. As a result, we can compute the amortized cost after n plus 1 operations, which is simply 1 plus 2. That gives you 3. The 1 here represents the actual cost of inserting an element when no resizing is needed, and the 2 comes from or above calculation on the change of potential. As a result, the amortized cost per operation under this scenario is bound by a constant number 3. Now let's look at the other scenario when resizing happens. 
Let's think about when the number of elements is n, same as the array capacity. When the insertion operation is executed now, it will lead to the array doubling its size. After copying and pasting all the existing n elements, the new element is added. So the new number of elements becomes n plus 1, which is also the actual cost. I can use a potential function to compute the potential after n insertion operations and n plus 1 insertion operations separately. After n plus 1 operations, the potential is calculated as 2 multiplied by n plus 1. After that, it would subtract 2 multiplied by n from it. The result is 2. The n plus 1 here represents the current number of elements in the array. And 2 multiplied by n represents the current capacity of the array. Remember, the array has already doubled its size by this time of point. After n operations, the potential is calculated as 2 multiplied by n minus n, where n represents both the number of elements and the size of the array. Remember, this is the time of point when the array is fully occupied. So the change in potential is calculated as 2 minus n. And the amortized cost after n plus 1 insertion operations is simply the sum between n plus 1 and the change of potential. The n plus 1 here represents the actual cost, where you copy and paste all the existing elements. After that, you add a new element, that's why it's n plus 1. The change of potential comes from or above calculation, 2 minus n. As you can see, the amortized cost when resizing happens is also bound by a constant number 3. That said, in both cases, a constant number bounds the amortized cost per operation. You may stop here and conclude that the amortized cost per operation is simply big O of 1. But it's better that you move to the next steps to verify that the total amortized costs always bounds the total actual cost. Let's do that. Step 3 is actually very much self-telling. We have this formula, a relationship between the total amortized cost and the total actual cost. The potential after an operation is a number bigger than or equal to 0, and the potential at the beginning when the array size is 0, and there is no element at all, is simply 0. As such, the total amortized cost bounds the total actual cost. The verification is successful, so let's move to calculate the average amortized cost per operation. If you don't want to do that, you can simply stick to the result you have gained from step 2. If you want to go over step 4, it simply takes dividing n on both sides of the equation. Regardless of the resizing and copying and pasting all the elements, the total actual cost can be estimated to linear time. The same can be said for the potential change between the state after n operations and the initial state. From the four-step amortized analysis using the potential method, we can see that on average, the insertion operation runs on constant time. In this video, we learned about the potential method and explored how it can be applied to amortized analysis using an example. That's everything about this series on amortized analysis. Hope you learned something new.